Hello everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. When individuals of all age groups suffer from some sort of mental illness, the explosion in mental health problems puts nations on the path of a mental health epidemic. As a result, it is not only the economic cost of mental health crises that is becoming an issue, the societal risks are also getting very complex. Now, considering that drug abuse is growing and suicide rates are increasing, in a crisis that is becoming increasingly catastrophic, there is a need for technology solutions for timely diagnosis and therapy. Many of the emerging technology solutions with machine learning at their core offer hope for not only timely diagnosis of mental health diseases, but also gives us a promise of reversing the decline in mental wellness. To discuss one such potential solution, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Dr. Jamie Fusner to Risk Roundup. Dr. Fusner is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at Brain Research Institute, UCLA. He's based in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Fusner. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Wonderful, Professor Pusner. So as nations confront the complexity of mental health illnesses, a lack of understanding of its root causes or genetic predisposition or biochemical work and effective treatments are worsening the crisis that is uh, necessitating perhaps the technology-based solutions. And it seems that the emerging artificial intelligence machine learning solutions are an opportunity to address the growing crisis so from your assessment, what is the machine learning potential to diagnose and treat mental illnesses? And how do you vision machine learning changing mental health in the coming years? Yeah, so as you mentioned that uh, this is a, a very much a crisis, I think, in, in the United States and in the world, um, the severity of mental illness and how little it's recognized and and really part of the reason why it's difficult to to recognize and also to develop good treatments for psychiatric illnesses is that the brain is exceedingly complex. So we have more neurons in our brains than there are people on the, in the world, um, believe it or not. And so in order to really help solve this complexity of uh, how the brain produces behavior and how it can manifest in different symptoms associated with psychiatric illnesses, we really need complex solutions. So we need the ability to harness the power of uh, machine learning and algorithms that go beyond what um, humans can devise in terms of their strategies and figuring out ways on their own of testing hypotheses. Yes, that is very true. Human brain is very, very complex. And if we look at the field of psychiatry currently, they they all rely on patient reporting and physician observations mainly for clinical decision making. Whereas if we look at the <clears throat> other branches of medicine, they have incorporated biomarkers to aid in the diagnosis and determining, you know, what is the prognosis and or what sort of selection uh, treatment they should give to patients. But neither of those are available as far as psychiatry is concerned because we just don't have understanding of the biomarkers and, uh, you know, having any uh, structured approach to what medicine, you know, to give. And that is a problem more also with the uh, medical sector. But uh, how do you see these machine learning help identify biomarkers for mental diseases so that it becomes much more easier to quantify and uh, that way, you know, prove easily that, yes, there is a, you know, uh, the problem developing and we should address that. Yeah, exactly. You, you hit on two really important points um, in psychiatry. One is that the psychiatric diagnoses are, are largely based on and, and um, reliant on self-report. And so <clears throat> the problem with that is that self-report, um, for one, is not always reliable. Uh, so a person may... Um, either not understand their own illness well enough to really be able to report verbally what's going on with themselves, or they might have a reason for denying symptoms or for minimizing symptoms, uh, or, you know, there, there's other factors as well. They may confuse certain symptoms with other ones or attribute it to some other problem. And and so this is the challenge that psychiatrists have is that is that they really have to rely on this. They can also get information from other um, sources like family members and so forth. But ultimately what it comes down to is it comes down to 
relying on, on subjective report, sometimes from a brain um, whose illness and disease itself prevents the person from understanding themselves, you know, creating this catch-22. Um, and, then it, and then it's up to the psychiatrist to try to figure out based on what he or she understands about diagnostic criteria to fit this in or not, think about longitudinal course. And so then what happens is that the, the human, we rely on the human brain the human brain's power to discern patterns and to match patterns. What, what machine learning does has done in many ways, it's, it's really, in a way, especially with more advanced techniques and deep learning, um, it's like reverse engineering the brain. It's actually how it started to be developed, um, some of the deep learning techniques um, in neural networks. And so, but, but reverse engineering, engineering the brain in a way that is much more objective. And that's, that's where the problem lies with the psychiatrist and their ability to do pattern recognition and see what fits with a certain diagnosis and what fits with certain effective treatments or not is that it's limited to that person's own experience, you know, and what, you know, certainly what they've read in books, but it, it becomes biased based on what they've seen in their own practice over the, over many years. And so machine learning offers a way of, providing that same kind of pattern recognition, but in an unbiased way, like fully unbiased way. That, that, that is partially true, I would think. You know, if we are training algorithms, yeah. uh, if the training data sets are involved, then again, there is a possibility of the bias, you know, emerging just like, you know, any other algorithms that uh, computer scientists yeah. are developing. So, but if we don't use the training data sets and you know then it, you're absolutely right then that objectivity will be there and we will have a totally unbiased algorithms and we will be able to identify the patterns now is there any specific pattern of changes in brain networks that can relate to psychiatric symptoms has there been any studies on that um yeah there there have been a number of studies so there there are um, many researchers who are working on trying to do a couple different important things in psychiatric illness. One of them being <clears throat> just to be able to say predict. So prediction of an outcome, like a longitudinal outcome in terms of the course of illness or a prediction in terms of response to treatment. And there's also the application of machine learning classification to classify individuals with certain diagnostic um, criteria or to classify them based on, say, um, dichotomous outcome, like a responder or non-responder to a medication. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so there, there, there are people that are working on this, on this in psychiatry, and um, it definitely shows promise to be able to then take what could be both objective biomarkers that could be related to, say, brain structure, brain function, um, some combination of that, and also subjective report as well. Because subjective report might additionally have value, especially when it's combined um, with brain biomarkers. There's other types of biomarkers too that can have to do with brain waves, AEG, or um, physiological responses. So there are many different types of ways that we can try to to get at what's happening in the brain and to use it in complex algorithms to figure out prognostic value or to classify individuals. Yes, no, that research and that understanding would be so welcoming. And I was just thinking that uh, uh, in the recent years, there all these uh, biohackers, they are experimenting with binaural beats, you know, trying to have some sort of uh, sound, you know, uh, that go, you listen, you know, with the headphones and uh, that actually, you know, a uh, lot of people, again, you know, there is no direct, uh, proof here but a lot of people claim that you know they feel very calm after that and you know their depression disappears and they are no longer sad so it, it maybe you know there is a correlation that uh, the binaural beats or the sounds that actually changes the brain wave pattern and you know it helps all those people who are experimenting with that but from your assessment what are the factors that influence the changes in the pattern the brain pattern well, I mean, I, so I can speak to some some specific studies that, that we've done um, that I have the, the most knowledge and expertise with. And so one of them 
is a study that we published recently where we were interested in understanding two disorders that are relatively understudied, but are both potentially very severe. So one of them is anorexia nervosa, which probably most people have heard about and kind of recognize and appreciate the severity of this where people become exceedingly emaciated um, and go through a starvation state, have a fear of gaining weight, and the mortality rate of anorexia is very high. It's the highest of any psychiatric disorder. Most, most of the people, if they die, they die from medical complications from starvation. And we, and we still know very little about the brains and, and why people do these behaviors and how we can help them. And the other disorder that, that we've been studying is something called body dysmorphic disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder, in a way, similar to anorexia nervosa, people have a misperception about their appearance. So in anorexia, the misperception is that people generally think that they're overweight or at the very least that they're not ex very thin, when in fact they are very thin. In body dysmorphic disorder, the concern can be about any kind of feature that they think is very defective and ugly. And this has caused them to have depression, to not go out in social situations, and to do all sorts of behaviors to try to fix their appearance or check it in a very compulsive way. They suffer a lot as well, and about a quarter of them, about 25% of them, will attempt suicide in their lifetime. Um, it's a very severe disorder. And these two disorders actually share a lot of features. So they share this distortion of perception. Um, they also both tend to have obsessions, compulsions. They have, both tend to have some depression, some anxiety, um, poor insight often. And when people have these disorders, sometimes, especially in the early parts of the illness, it's very difficult to tell what disorder it could be. And <clears throat> using the diagnostic criteria from the, from the DSM to make these diagnoses and then to using um, the field has generally used that to, to dictate treatments. But the treatments for the two different disorders are actually quite different. And the treatments that you would apply to someone with body dysmorphic disorder don't work quite as well in people with anorexia. So it's actually very critical to distinguish these two to know what types of treatments. Yes, so and, it is. Uh, you are absolutely right because this is such a complex challenge that, and I'm glad that your group is working on and you all have done such impressive work uh, that uh, can end up being this potential, potential solution for this timely diagnosis of this uh, very grave, you know, uh, mental health situ uh, situation. So what do you think would be the root cause of, you know, why people feel the way they feel about their body and uh, have that kind of disorder? Yeah. So we so we are we are doing different types of research. One of the research is on what are what are some of the causes uh, based on what may be happening in the brain, what kind of pathophysiology is occurring in the brain, <clears throat> and so so that's a line of research that we've conducted, and that has um, indicated that there may be abnormalities in the way that people are processing visual information that could account in both disorders for some of the perceptual distortions. So we've been looking at kind of like one slice of the symptoms in both disorders, namely the distortion of perception to try to understand what basis in the brain does it have? And we found that actually the way that the visual system is processing information um, is different than in healthy controls. And in both disorders, we see this pattern where there's a predominance of what we call detailed visual processing. So people are, their brains essentially are uh, focusing and honing in on very small details about their appearance. So that could be something like a facial blemish in people with BD, body dysmorphic disorder, BDD, or it could be um, a, a, a small area where it looks like they have a little skin fold that's they think is fat on their abdomen or their thigh. <clears throat> and their brains don't seem to be visually integrating in a, in a larger and more holistic sense how these pieces fit together and that these things are, are generally in most people very small details compared to the whole overall body and shape and appearance. And so if their brains are not processing visual information well, then their experience, their subjective experience is that they have defective parts of their appearance that they think are noticeable to other people and make them look ugly or fat in some way that makes them kind of socially unacceptable. See, I mean, this is very interesting because it's all about how your brain processes things and it's about how your brain analyzes things. So there is nothing, 
I mean, is there any biochemistry involved or it's just about the thought process that how you look at life, how you look at things? Yeah. Because I was reading about some research done at Stanford. They have come up with a uh, AI board that actually, you know, reinforces positive way of looking at things. And a uh, lot of people are using that uh, AI tool that has been developed by Stanford and uh, it actually helps them because it reinforces their you know positive approach and positive viewpoint so do you think that that could have a correlation in something like this that if you in uh, constantly uh, enforce that uh, thought process to your brain that look at things positively look at things positively then pro perhaps you know uh, that pattern can be changed is there any correlation with yeah that? well I, I think that theoretically something like that um, could work because the way that we think um, is generally in a certain pattern, right? And so we we don't all often think that that our thought process is habitual, um, but in most cases, most things in our life, it is. So in other words, we tend to think the same types of thoughts in certain situations, and in some in some cases, especially in psychiatric disorders, that can maintain people in kind of a low mood state, if they're focusing, selectively focusing on things that are happening that are unfortunate or that are um, negative or pessimistic around them. Um, and the contrary, that if somebody is able to change thought patterns and then have that reinforced by constantly being reminded of it and actively practicing thinking a different way, then, then it is possible, I think, to have uh, major changes in the way that a person not only is thinking, but also is feeling as a result of those thoughts, and then importantly, also how they're behaving. Yes. And that, because that that really is the basis of a lot of different types of psychotherapies, and especially the psychotherapies that are a little bit more directed um, and and have people or encourage people to do things in, in a repeated way and practicing things over and over again, like cognitive behavioral therapy, that we know empirically that those types of therapies work for many different psychiatric disorders. Yes, very true, very true. And uh, as the competition heats up, you know, in the world, and you know, there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of fears, and automation, you know, jobs uh, will be gone. So there are a lot of these emotions, you know, that will be involved, and that would trigger a lot of these kind of uh, behavioral issues. So when you did this research, what data sets that you used? What were the data sets? Yeah, so going back to the, the research that we did with individuals who were, had anorexia nervosa and those who had body dysmorphic disorder, and we also had healthy controls. And our intent um, for that, for this particular one, is to distinguish between these diagnoses. And we used both neuro data about the brain from neuroimaging, and this includes data about white matter connectivity. Um, kind of the wiring the brain and also the brain's activity when people are viewing things that relate to their symptoms, in this case, viewing bodies and viewing faces. And then the other data that we collected was the subjective report about their level of anxiety and their level of depression. And then a third measure that is um, an insight measure. So we're able to quantify how well they're able to recognize that they have an illness and that their illness affects what they're experiencing. So we combined what we call neuroimaging and non-neuroimaging data or like subjective data and then more objective kind of brain biomarkers in a machine learning model to help classify whether individuals are either uh, patients, so they have anorexia or BDD or their healthy controls. And then secondly, to try to distinguish if somebody has anorexia from somebody who has body dysmorphic disorder. And so we had a, yeah, so we had, a, this particular study is a relatively small data set. Many neuroimaging studies are rel relatively small still, and this would be considered kind of a first step. So we had um, 24 people with anorexia nervosa and we had 29 people with body dysmorphic disorder and 31 healthy controls. And <clears throat> so using this data, we were, we were able to successfully classify with fairly high accuracy these three diagnoses. So we had an accuracy classification of a, about 76% um, from the three. We were best able, of course, to, to distinguish the non-patients from the patients, but also the anorexia patients from the BDD patients were able to have a fairly high accuracy 
um, over 70% of distinguishing those two as well. So you are able to quantify, and I, I'm thinking that because this is a processing capability of the brain, uh, some people who are suffering from this uh, mental disease, they just choose not to eat, then they, you know, they starve themselves. And on the other you know, end of the spectrum are those people who never get bothered about you know how they look or how much you know they eat what they what they should eat and they just keep eating and eating and eating and other you know sorts of diseases you know develop medical disease like diabetes or you know others so do you see that there would be any correlation you know uh, in the processing capability that you can identify the biomarker that you can identify that would give us some sort of indication the where you know this is going to move you know what kind of disease yeah. develop at an early age yeah, well, so we were able to to identify what could be considered a possible possible biomarker of anorexia nervosa, and and when we did this this machine learning analysis, we lear- use a type of machine learning that's called logistic regression in a cross validation procedure, and the benefit of doing that type of analysis as opposed to something that's a little bit more black box, um, like a support vector machine, for example. Um, or, uh, or, or even deep learning is that with with logistic regression, we're able to then identify which particular features that we used um, were significantly contributing to making accurate classifications, and not only which features were significantly contributing, but also the direction. So, for example, if somebody had um, better insight, was that contributing to them being one or the other diagnoses? And <clears throat> what we found in terms of a biomarker is that if individuals had what's called, th- this is a, a way of measuring how efficient the brain white matter network is is wired. So it's the pattern of connectivity across the whole brain in the white matter. And this pattern of connectivity can be a very different, what's called efficiency. So efficiency of information transfer across the whole brain we use something called path length, um, which is a measure of efficiency. What we found is that the, that lower brain network efficiency was significantly contributing to making an accurate classification of anorexia. Uh, so <clears throat> when we looked then at the actual values of, um, there's you know quantification for this of like a single number that represents how efficiently the brain is wired in this way uh, that the individual with anorexia nervosa had significantly lower um, global efficiency in network wiring than did the people with body dysmorphic disorder and the healthy controls. So this could represent a possible biomarker of illness. What was interesting though, is even within that, we looked closer at the distribution of, of this network, of this network measure, this, global efficiency method. And there seemed to be two groups of people with anorexia nervosa, people that had a slightly worse global efficiency and those that had ones that looked more along the lines of the healthy controls. So there was a, a subset that looked kind of normal in that sense and a subset that looked more severe. And this was just something that came out kind of unexpectedly from the research. And we haven't had a chance yet to fully understand why that is. So could there be different subgroups of people with anorexia nervosa Maybe it's a marker of those who might be more severe, but we don't know yet because um, we haven't looked at that. But that, that's the kind of thing that can come out of this research sometimes unexpectedly. But in the end, we have, have something that um, both has given us an idea about what may be a brain mechanism contributing to the illness, and then also just using it in a practical sense to be able to predict if somebody has a diagnosis of anorexia or BDD or they're a healthy control. Oh, this is such a uh, interesting research because understanding that or identifying possibly what control needs to be there, and if we can, you know, artificially insert that control, we'll be able to control so many diseases. Not only you know mental diseases, but also mm-hmm. biological, uh, physical diseases, you know, medical diseases that uh, mm-hmm. are you know happening. So I hope that your uh, team, you know, works uh, yeah. more in depth into this field. Because this is certainly, you know, the what you are doing has uh, broad implications for human health and uh, wellness. So that would be very fascinating to see uh, what you all, you know, come up with. And I hope you, uh, develop, you know, 
can figure out all these uh, broader you know understanding and solutions to all these uh, complex problems that we are facing because according to the world health organization depression alone is affecting like 300 million people around the you know yeah. uh, across nations and bipolar disorder is about uh, 18 60 million and schizophrenia is about 20 something million so uh, if we are diagnosing all these you know currently if you are diagnosing based on the display of symptoms only then the question is whether the current model is viable and it looks like it's not viable because we are not in a timely manner able to understand that these problems are developing and we are not able to intervene at that uh, you know in a timely yeah. manner and the crisis you know just keeps uh, growing uh, bigger and bigger so uh, do, do you think by understanding what you all are doing and what other researchers are doing uh, in i mean last few years almost like 200 research papers have been published uh, uh you know on some sort of uh, analysis that has been uh, understanding that is going on research going on so that's a it's very good you know it's very positive sign that we are a uh, lot of scientists and researchers like you are working on this field so do you think that all these broader problems like all these bipolar disorder or depression and all that that uh, we'll be able to figure out uh, solutions to that in the coming years I, I yes I'm optimistic that we'll be able to to figure out solutions and and certainly improve the way that we're identifying people and also the way that we can treat people as well and one one of the keys I think is trying to identify people on um, very early on so that um either either their parents or um themselves before the illness is developed to the point where they may have lost the ability to even understand their own illness that that could be a time to intervene and also before there have been many years of negative consequences of the illness for example the loss of uh, productivity and the loss of um of the social network and uh and the loss <clears throat> and like a reduced kind of sense of self and self efficacy that can happen from having many years of illness cuz the the biggest problems that we have I think that that cross many of those disorders you talked about like depression um and especially schizophrenia bipolar disorder and also the other ones that I've been talking about um body dysmorphic disorder anorexia nervosa is that when these conditions are chronic um that's not only when the people suffer the most but also when the disorders seem to be the most intractable and if we can try to then intervene early instead and that could mean identifying people early on possibly using biomarkers even before symptoms develop or when maybe there's a hint of a symptom or even when people that are at high risk cuz they have a many um people in their family have the illness for example that that could be um a way that we could seriously reduce the burden of illness um across the world because yes. treatments do tend to work better if if you intervene earlier yes very true very true that uh, does definitely make a difference and if we look at this loneliness is uh, one of the top 10 strategic security risk facing the future of humanity and if we see now you know loneliness is tied to so many diseases because you know you are lonely you know you are uh, you don't have hope you don't have purpose you don't have uh, you know anyone to share with us it just goes you know the cascading effect of it in any people it just uh, big, it's a beginning of you know many problems happening in the body and in the mind and uh, human organ in silo is not the same as the you know overall human body system so even though psychiatry is seeking to measure the mind which is is probably not the same thing as you know the brain and you know understanding the whole body because everything is interconnected interdependent so while the hope is that machine learning will lead to more data driven understanding of mental illnesses do you think that it will be able to give us accurate understanding of you know what problems are at the root cause of it because what we are seeing in the brain or what we'll see the patterns it is just a symptom it is not the causation right i mean the cause mm -hmm. is probably something different so will we be able to use machine learning to understand what is the root cause of all those problems or why we are seeing the pattern we are seeing in the brain i th i think that it it'll, it'll be helpful i um machine learning by itself of course won't be able to solve it it needs to be humans using it 
um, in a way that is is a tool and using it prudently and using it in a way that kind of makes sense um, in addition to using other tools as well. But, you know, one, one of the, I think, criticisms of some types of machine learning analyses is that the it does not give us an indication of of specifically what is happening, for example, in the brain. So if we do a study where we look at brain connectivity, maybe using thousands of different sets of connections in the brain, and we use machine learning to try to understand if we can predict using this multivariate pattern, a certain outcome or a diagnosis, um, while it, it could help us predict it accurately, it doesn't, it can't tell us something in a way that we as human beings can understand because the interactions are happening on such a high dimensional plane, you know, a dimensional plane of like hundreds or thousands, um, such that it's it's too complex an equation to verbally describe or to write down or for humans to even kind of wrap their minds around understanding. And so that, that can be a criticism of machine learning is that it remains that way. We can't explain what's happening. We can't necessarily get at a root cause if that's the case. But, but one possibility, which I think that we have to kind of face in our field and in our society is that these, the complexity, the high dimensional interactions of not only the brain itself, but also how the brain and the person interacts with their environment, their social network, um, other factors like loneliness, other environmental factors. It is such a complex equation that it, it may be exceedingly difficult to find a cause. I mean, the best that we can do is to find multiple different causes and then hopefully also identify in each individual person what are the combination of of, of, imp of the most important factors that contribute to them developing the illness that might be different than something else. So that's mm -hmm. more of like a personalization. I think that the personalization aspect of it, of figuring out what in this individual has contributed and understanding that it's not going to be the same in everybody. We can't mm -hmm. keep thinking about things in like an average sense that I do think that tools like machine learning can help us be able to get at that. And they may not be able to, to um, tell us exactly what it is, but they can give us um, a probabilistic estimate so we can at least hone down our efforts to try to help remediate a certain problem that might contribute in this particular individual to the illness. Sure. But I think in time, we will be able to get a deeper understanding because think about it, if everyone has a personalized, uh, you know, assistant, AI assistant, the uh, uh, but looking at, you know, what that individual is eating, drinking, what kind of stress levels that person has, or what is in the environment and uh, how satisfied that person is, or how many toxins are in the environment. And internally, if we insert, you know, nanosensors and uh, uh, have, you know, machine learning, you know, AI mm -hmm. interact with it and understand what changes are happening inside the body and because of the changes happening in the outside of the body in maybe you know in 10 years we will be able to get a deeper understanding yeah. and understand exactly what's happening or who knows in five ten years we all will have our own bots you know guiding us giving us psychotherapy you know and uh, telling us you know how to look at things telling uh, you know and watching uh, every change that is happening in our body and in brain and our mind so that is possible i mean that uh, maybe that uh, that is a path you know that the research will take but again it's uh, too early but mental health disorders are also the shapeless thing because we we just there is you don't know how to define it or restrict it to one thing because one uh, you know symptom uh, can have 10 different you know causation you know 10 yeah. different kind of things so all this you know is a uh, very it, it makes the diagnosis very difficult, but by combining with the research that, uh, the kind of research that you did, neuroimaging or, you know, uh, using MRI and other digital data and other other data factors, a machine learning algorithm can help us, you know, diagnose disorders very quickly with speed and accuracy. And we can give timely, inter you know, intervention. But so do you have the hope that, you know, the, as the research progresses, that we will be able 
to understand the root causes of all these diseases using machine learning and all these different you know other you know advances that are happening in nanotechnology and uh, you know other fields do you have the how do you feel about that yeah, no I, i definitely <clears throat> i definitely think that machine learning um, will help the field very much in, in um, understanding different contributors to the illness and also to be able to um, help us clinically make decision make decisions based on individual patterns in patients. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that that you know mostly I've been talking about what we call supervised machine learning, where we kind of have an end goal and we think that we would like to develop an algorithm, test an algorithm to say predict an outcome or to predict or classify a diagnosis. But the other type of machine learning um, is the more the unsupervised type. And that's where we in a more unconstrained way, <clears throat> try to let, let the algorithm tell us um, what are the patterns that are emerging in this data. And that may be a way of coming up with even better classification and diagnostic systems than we have currently. Yes, but uh, see, my uh, there is one you know risk factor that I see is that these the te the fact the study that has been happening you know they are all using uh, different kind of tools like you know uh, neuroimaging and you know MRIs and other you know but not all the people go you know have that those tests done so and there are like you know many diagnosed patients with mental health illness I mean, a lot of people go to doctors you know and they get you know scans done or they get some sort of data then you know they get referred to a psychiatrist so but that they're not all people so there are while millions have you know this kind of uh, diagnostic help from their physician general physician or from you know some sort of diagnostic test there are millions that have no you know test and they don't go to doctors or they are, they haven't been to doctors so it, that is also a limiting factor that we will not be able to if we if we depend on these tests we will not be able to identify mental health problems developing in all those you know millions of people that are not tested so maybe we have to come up with a technology solution that yeah. we can apply on everyone and they don't have yeah. to go and you know take MRI, mris or you know other tests so uh, we have to come up with a effective way that uh, everybody like you know so everyone is using probably smartphone not everyone right now but everyone will be using smartphone in the coming year so mm -hmm. maybe we have to develop some sort of application that everyone you know or computer everyone no. is going to use computer so uh, how a computer can quickly you know scan uh, the human brain we'll have to come up with something like that yeah, exactly do that and i and i think that that's that is generally pr the progression of technology where technology generally starts from something that is much more expensive, it's less readily available, um, it's often like larger in size, <clears throat> less practical to use. And so for example, maybe that's the stage that we're at right now and using the technology of MRI to do some of the brain imaging and to understand brain biomarkers like I've been talking about, like white matter connectivity patterns, for example. Um, <clears throat> but as, as uh, technology improves and also as we continue to do this type of research and we try to um, not only improve our accuracy of, of predicting or diagnosing or prognosticating, but also making it um, more and more simple and more and more accessible and readily available. So for example, maybe the next step from the research um, that I mentioned would be to see if there are non-neuroimaging ways <clears throat> um, of identifying the proxies for say the white matter network organization so there may be something that we could measure again objectively but is it is an indirect way but perhaps as predictive and as useful as measuring the actual white matter connectivity tracks in the brain reproduced from the mri images in some other way um, and that might be uh it might be something that is uh, as simple as a behavioral task that we apply to somebody, but again, objective because the person doesn't know, like, should they be doing one thing or another? Um, but that's a way that, you know, as we progress, we may be able to find things that are simpler and easier and cheaper, but still support um, high classification accuracy 
And then also in parallel, if technology is improving and we're able to, for example, perhaps do types of brain imaging that become cheaper, smaller, less expensive, more widely available, um, you know, m maybe like very limited number of sensor EEG, for example, sure. but just like one, one example, that <clears throat> that could become more widely available. The example that you gave of smartphones, you know, so mm -hmm. smartphones, you know, it, a smartphone is essentially a very powerful computer. If this were to go back several decades, that nobody would have such a powerful computer. There would only be a few of them in the in the world, um, but they would become smaller, cheaper, um, more readily accessible for for most people. And now they can collect a lot of data on that smartphone itself. So maybe smartphones could be one way of doing it, or other technology that like that in a similar way becomes. Um, more readily accessible and cheaper. Uh, perhaps, you know, it's, it's definitely possible. And we can, uh, the researchers can probably use also the speech patterns or facial yeah. patterns. Mm -hmm. And because all these technologies are becoming very, uh, you know, common now, facial recognition yeah. technology and all that. And who knows in the coming years, internet will be replaced by brain net. And then, you know, direct brain to brain communication will happen. And if mm -hmm. that is the case, then, you know, a lot of the problems will be much easier, you know, for the, uh, mental health community because then you know it will be easy to diagnose or you know interrupt uh, or intervene not interrupt intervene mm -hmm. in a timely manner because uh, the brain that would be able to you know give that tool that is so make that will make the mental health professionals life much easier but uh, what comp as you all you know do research you're trying to find solutions to all these complex uh, Problems. Where do you face the biggest challenges right now? You know what uh, needs to be there that will make uh, your research and your team research or other researchers' research, you know, much easier as you all try to find solutions. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in psychiatry research that speaks to the, the fact that the brain is so complex and these illnesses are so complex that we really need very large sample studies. We need many, many participants in these studies. And that's often challenging to do um, for one researcher. So we need networks of people in consortia that come together to share data. Um, but there's challenges in that sharing of data because if we're acquiring the data at different places, we have to have kind of standardized tools to do so. Um, we have to have people that are able to get along with each other and agree on things, um, which is another challenge. Um, everybody needs to get some kind of credit for it in some way. Otherwise, they can't get promotions or what, um, whatever they need for their own career. Um, so there's a lot of things that are working against the mm -hmm. fact that we all know that we need to share information. We need very large sample sizes. But um, may, because many people understand that this is really the way that it has to go, uh, that many research groups are, are doing this, they're involved in consortium, they're sharing data, there are larger studies that are coming out, there's more standardized procedures that people are agreeing on. And so all of that is going, I think, in the right direction, but it's still a bit of a, a challenge that way. Um, and the other, I think another challenge has to do with uh, the public and there's still being a lot of stigma, of stigma associated with mental illness, even, even though things have improved, um, over time, but still there's a lot of stigma associated with it. And I think because of that stigma, people themselves are um, less able or willing to um, seek care maybe early when they need to. Um, and, and also the stigma, I think, affects other things like people's willingness to fund research or to consider and appreciate the importance of, of um, mental health amongst health in general for for your whole body and your whole being. Uh, so those are factors that still are hurdles because that affects you know, the funding and affects people deciding to go into a career in um, psychiatric research versus not and so forth. Yes, very true. No, those are complex challenges. And I think that is uh, not just for this industry, but all industries, you know, people are not collaborating, not sharing the data. And uh, there are, you know, a lot of... Uh, 
trust issues also and like you said you know credit issues and you know a uh, lot of you know variables play a role but i hope that you know everyone can work together across nations because with having the those large data sets from across nations we will be able to identify uh, you know so many patterns and it will be so much easier to develop solution because this is not just about solving the mental health problem this is about the strategic security for the future of humanity because if we do not you know identify those things that drive people to do what they do and how to prevent how to develop you know effective controls then you know we will not be able to uh, prevent the catastrophe or crisis in the future and uh, individual at individual level everyone needs to understand what the consequences of those actions are if they are not well you know mentally not well what could happen they you know uh, press a nuclear button you know or they uh, do any mp attack or uh, now you know synthetic biology anybody can uh, from in any part of the world just in few th- 40 50000 $50, can have their own lab and create some pathogen you know releasing the world and destroy the you know, humanity there are so many variables and so much is at risk so and mental health plays you know the role you know it's at the f- forefront of all that because you know if they are not sane then they will do whatever you know they want to do and that can put the future of humanity at risk so this is Uh, we have to think about the strategic security and the neural feedback it will help us understand you know how every individual is whether they are well what they are doing and how it's going to impact and as we try to rehabilitate the ability of humans to think about the future we are potentially not only solving mental health disorders but we will be you know protecting or securing the future of the humanity so uh, i think uh, psychiatry and mental health professionals has a huge role to play as far as the you know future of humanity goes because that is at the core of everything that is happening so having said that what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners about your initiatives or about uh, uh, your uh, research that you are doing and uh, what whether you know if somebody wants to cooperate whether someone wants to uh, partner with you in your research uh where they should you know go to and especially what would you like to tell those brilliant young curious minds who wants to get involved in the research to developing machine learning tools mm-hmm. for mental health or would like to get help from the emerging tools yeah so so i guess a, a few important messages that i'd like people to to know is i mean first of all people that might be suffering from psychiatric illnesses or have a family member is that there are there are treatments that are out there they may not be perfect but there are many good treatments for people and people can recover from many psychiatric illnesses so seeking treatment is something that's very important i think secondly um showing an inter- an interest in in mental health and the brain and psychiatric illness um an interest in understanding it better um will help decrease stigma and also if you have a very strong interest and a passion and you want to apply some of your technical abilities and skills that you might have in computing and data science in um in neuroscience in psychology on uh, to understanding the brain and to helping uh with psych understanding and developing better treatments for psychiatric disorders then this is a very worthy field to go into um and it's something that many people can benefit from in a very real way because it involves a decrease in suffering and that that helping and decrease in suffering is something that is very meaningful for people's lives. And then the, the other major message as well is that that we need help the psychiatric researchers and clinicians um because psychi- psychiatric illnesses are generally illnesses that are um that are underfunded in terms of uh in terms of insurance companies and in terms of government dollars going towards research and so we can greatly benefit from private foundation grant support and also from our legislators and our government understanding the importance of this um and to allocate appropriate funds for research that is not only just about practical things like treatments but also about understanding the mechanisms and the ultimate causes of these illnesses 
Yes, very true. Absolutely, because human behavior is at the center of all this uh, complex uh, crisis that is happening across nations. So, thank you so much, Professor Fursan, for participating in Risk Roundup. Today. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for the great questions. Very okay. stimulating conversation. Wonderful. So thank you so much. So we appreciate your thoughtful insight on machine learning for mental health. And even if a single decision maker can understand the strategic implications of machine learning on psychiatry, based on the discussion we had today, this risk round of dialogue has been of service. And we thank you for that. Right. Wonderful. So Risk Good. Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology convergence and transformation happening across cyberspace, aquaspace, geospace and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts fit into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the Risk Roundups, to watch, listen to the Risk Roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupalacy.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.